We are talking about for this year, resting in his love. I was just talking with someone last night and, and, and we were just talking about all the things that were going on in the world. In everything, it seems like that is not of Christ, is driven by hatred. Let's get the vaxxed people to hate the unvaxxed people and blame them and then vice versa. And then let's anybody not wearing a mask, give them the, the stank eye and all of this kind of stuff. Everything is driven by hatred. That should tell you that we are in the last days because Jesus says the love of the majority in the last days will grow cold. Or in the old King James, it says it will wax cold. This is why this is our theme for this year, because no matter what people say to you, what people do to you, our, our you know, disappearing republic that's becoming tyranny, um, that's not a done deal yet. And so we need to be loving people radically. Yes, please stand up there. I'm not the guy that says sit back and do nothing. You need to cast your votes. You need to be informed. That's why it's so important that you go to this thing on Saturday. There'll be so much good information to give you instead of just watching our world crumble around us. So there is truth. The Bible says that Jesus was full of grace and truth, okay? So we need to know the truth, which is Satan is the God of this world. All of this stuff that is coming down is all from his direction, but we cannot forget grace. We can't fight back against the enemy. We can fight back against him. Remember, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this darkness, but you don't fight people. Okay? Do you understand? We are not, we are not, Jesus never signed off on the fact that we're supposed to hate people, that we're supposed to be mean to people, that we're supposed to do any of these kind of things. How many of you know that the Bible says that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance? It's not about bullying people into Christ. It's about loving people radically that they come into the kingdom. Amen? So we need to live in this place. Today's message that we're going to be talking about is by grace through faith. Last week, we talked about grace. Now, we are saved by grace, but grace, grace's activation comes only by our faith. And the reason I know this is because the Bible says that the whole world was saved by grace. But if it is by grace alone and nothing else, then that means the entire population of the planet and all of its past, present, and future are all going to be in the kingdom someday. And Jesus himself said that is not true. He made statements like the, the wide path and the wide gate that most people are going that way. And oh, by the way, that leads to destruction. It is the small path, it is the small gate that leads to life, and few find it. So how is this possible if we're all saved by grace? Well, your, the grace of God is activated by faith. Okay, I'm going to put some scripture references up here. I, it should be in your notes. If, if you don't have the app, take a picture of it, because I was actually going to spend a lot of time teaching through this today, and like the Holy Spirit always does, it seems like the night before, uh, he shows me some other things, and instead of me, literally I planned on going through all of Romans 4 and then the first five verses of 5. That would have taken a long time, and believe me, there's awesome stuff in there, which is why I'm giving it to you for homework, okay? Okay. We're gonna, the reason why these verses are, are, are important is because Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 talks about, has the phrase, we're saved by grace through faith. Romans 4, all the way through 5, the first five verses of 5, talks about how we are saved by, un, or we are, excuse me, we are brought into the promise by believing Abraham. Not us believing in Abraham, but the faith of Abraham. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And you need to read Romans 4 because a lot of people are confused by what is the difference between faith and works. Even Martin Luther was confused by this. Do you know he actually petitioned to get the book of James uh, at one time removed from the canonized scripture because he could not reconcile the idea if we're saved by grace through faith, what is James talking about this faith without works is dead stuff? 
But in a culture like today, we need to understand what words meant then and what they mean now. A lot of time when people hear, well, you know, faith without works is dead, we move into this mode of believing that we need to hold on to our salvation by working. You know, people quote this phrase all the time, well, you must work out your salvation by fear and trembling. That is actually a scripture, but the context of that is not talking about that you work out your salvation, meaning working it with fear and trembling, meaning like at any moment you mess up, God's going to take you out. That is not our loving father. When you read Romans, it talks about that if you work a job and you get paid at the end of the week or at the end of every two weeks, When you receive that money, are you like, man, I'm just so grateful. Man, my boss, he just blessed me so much. No, you're like, I earned every dime of this and then some. And what's this? Joe Biden's taking a bunch of my money too. You believe that you worked for that, right? So it's not credited to you. You earned it. Grace, by definition, is unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. You didn't earn a dime of grace. It was freely given to you. So when the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith, that doesn't mean like, oh, we're saved by grace, so now I must do ministry, I must love my family, I must do all of these things because God is watching and keeping a tally, and if I don't do all of these things, I could lose my salvation in the process. That is not scripture. So when we want to say the difference between faith and works, the difference is, is faith is, uh, this is the simplest way I can put it. And believe me, I stole this because I'm not smart enough to come up with this on my own. Faith is, and you can write this down, faith is acting like it's true. Everything by grace, you act like it's true. Because I hear people all the time talking about, well, I've got faith, I've got faith, I've got faith. But, but if we look, and again, this is not accusatory. I, have, I do this in my own life. If your life, the way that you conduct your life, the way that you spend your money, the way that you raise your family, all of these different things is what you really believe. Does this make sense? You can boast to other people what your faith is, and they may or may not believe you, but God can see directly into your heart of what you really believe. So everything is provided by grace, and I mean everything. Do you know that the Bible says in uh, Romans 8, 29, God, who did not spare his son, but gave him for us, how will he not also, through him, freely give us what? All things. The the Greek word for all is all. There's no deep Greek meaning in that. It is all. And see, people, and you know this, and maybe some of you have been raised in different denominations, so this is, is something that's very glaring and obvious to you, is different denominations receive differently from Jesus based on how they believe. How many of you know there's denominations um, and there are churches like this one that believe that healing was paid for at the cross? Uh, If you don't believe that, you need to come to Healing You on Tuesdays. Healing, just like your entrance into heaven, was paid for at the cross. Now, a lot of churches don't teach that, and they'd be wrong. But see... Isn't it interesting that we use these things to divide us? Because the bottom line is, what does it matter with the church down the road, how they feel about whether we believe in healing or not? Why should it matter to us whether they believe in healing or not? Now, I don't want them to, you know, be sick and dying and that kind of stuff, so I'm not saying that we don't care about that, but grace activation in your life is based on what you believe, period. So when, we, when, when I say the phrase, act like it's true, it, that's what it means. The way that you act, 
And I'm not talking about your works. I'm not talking about if you volunteer or if you serve in base camp or the nursery. Or I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about the way that you think, the way that you view life, and the way that you conduct yourself. And I'm going to move on from this point. But Romans 4 talks about how Abraham was unwavering in his faith. So much to the point where God promised him a son. He believed for that son. He gets that son. God says, now give him back to me on the altar. And that when you actually read in the book of Hebrews, when it talks about all of the great faith people, when it brings up Abraham, it says that he knew so much about the promises of God. He believed the promise of God so much That basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, that if God would have allowed him to sacrifice Isaac, God would then raise Isaac from the dead because the promise was through Isaac's seed. So he believed it so much. I mean, Abraham wasn't sitting here going, well, Lord, I don't understand. If I kill my son, then how are you going to bring forth? He didn't question any of that. Do you know that it says that God told him to give, give me your son, your only son? Which is interesting because he actually had Ishmael, but God didn't recognize that son because he wasn't the promised son. And he says, take your son, your only son, and take him up the mountain and sacrifice to him. Do you know it says that they were saddled and leaving early the next day? He didn't sit there for a week and think about it. But you know what? It was a three-day journey. Could you imagine the devil messing with his head in three days when you were literally walking with your son hand in hand knowing that you're going to kill him? Now, I know we can't relate to this today, and we're like, well, this just seems like a different God. It's not. Abraham was given the right to become the father of us all. Why? Because what Abraham was willing to do and didn't have to do, God was willing to do, and he saw it through in his own son. Abraham is a picture of God. So that is all in there. Have fun reading that. What I want to show you today are real examples with Jesus because I don't know how many of you have read your Gospels multiple times. Sometimes we pigeonhole Jesus or we have this idea of Jesus that, you know, he just walked around with a smile on his face all the time. And he's just like, I love you guys. Be blessed. You know, like the old religious pictures, his cheeks are always sunk in. He's like doing this. Like the glare from the lights, like religious pictures of Jesus crack me up. Um, and again, nobody knows what he looks like, but you know, when, when I picture the Jesus, I like, I'm so glad the chosen came out. Like that's how I see Jesus now, the guy from the chosen. And it's so funny because religion, I'm, and I'm going to get off this religious pictures got him like blonde hair and blue eyes. Apparently nobody's ever seen a Jewish person before. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. I'm moving on. So I want to show you today some scriptures that you may not were, were aware of, and it might shake your faith a little bit on who you think Jesus is. But the scriptures reveal Christ, amen? And that's the only way that we know him. Now, you can have a, a, a relationship with him, but to start off with how you know who Jesus is is what the gospels record about him, what they record about his ministry. So we're talking about by grace through faith, okay? We already expounded upon grace last week. If, if you weren't here, you can go on YouTube and get that. It's called uh, the gospel of grace. So we know what grace is, then what is our job? Our job is to simply believe it. And again, your walk, your life, everything you do is the fruit or the representation of what you really believe. Amen? Okay, so I want to show you a couple things. Let's go to Matthew 17. And again, I'm bringing up these specific stories because I want to show you that Jesus is passionate about our faith. Okay, uh, Matthew 17, let's start at verse 14. It says, when they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him. And he said this, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. 
for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Now, if you read in Matthew 10, Jesus commissions his disciples to go out in twos, and here is the commission. Preach the gospel. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. This was a commission that he gave his disciples. And obviously, they were doing that. How do we know? Why would this father know to bring his demon-possessed son to the disciples if there already wasn't a buzz about that the disciples of Jesus Christ are healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, and casting out demons? Amen? You, you with me? Okay. So it says, so, so, they, so, so, so the father's just like, look, look, I brought, I brought my son to them and they, and they could not cure him. Look what Jesus says. You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. That doesn't sound like the, I love you guys. Be blessed. Have a blessed day. That doesn't sound like that Jesus that we have that picture of. Now, I'm pulling up the Greek. And so the word for unbelieving is apistos, which that is correct, unbelieving. The word perverted in the Greek means distorted, misinterpreted, corrupt. Uh, the two Greek words that are put together to make that word are the word thoroughly turned. So basically, you know, like when we say, like when you're doing something wrong, do a 180 in your life, this is literally a 180 in the wrong direction. He is saying that their generation is so corrupt, they're 180 degrees in the wrong direction. Now, remember, his disciples have been going around and doing a pretty good job. Why didn't Jesus just go, guys, man, you guys have been doing so good. You guys are awesome. So you missed this one. It's not really a big deal. He looked at the crowd, the father standing there of the demon-possessed boy. The crowd is standing there. His disciples are standing there. And what does he do? He rebukes them publicly. You faithless, you unbelieving distorted, turned around generation. How much longer will I stay with you? Now, again, we don't have inflection and things like that. We don't have a recording of this. I believe that everything that God does is from love. So I believe what he's saying in is, is Jesus, if he could be frustrated, is frustrated. He is, knows, he knows that his ministry time is very short and he's got to train up an army of people. That will carry out his work. How do we know that? And, and, and by the way, carry out his work the same way that he did it. In John 14, 12, the Bible clearly says that believers will do the works that I do. And this is Jesus talking. And yes, even greater. Do we see the church today doing the works of Christ on a regular basis? No. Other than maybe preaching the gospel. That's one part. He said, you will do the works that I do, the very works that I do, that you will do. So, so Jesus does not take this, oh, well, you know, you missed it this time, guys. Better luck next time. So let's go back to the text. How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And it says, and Jesus rebuked him, meaning the demon, and the demon came out of him. And the boy was cured at once. Now, this is the part that really ruffles people here. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately. <laughs> You've just been rebuked by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in public. You've got to figure this thing out. We're not going to have a public display here. So they pulled Jesus aside in private. So he says this. Why could we not drive in? it out. We want to know, right? You know what? You know how many times I ask the question when we pray for somebody and we don't see somebody instantaneously healed? Why could I not cure them? 
And I'm not getting into this semantical argument of going, well, pastor, you can't cure everybody. It's the power of God. Duh. But are we not called to heal the sick? I'm not saying it's my power. I even think Jesus would say it's not his power because it says that power left him when the woman touched his garment. He did no miracles until he received power from on high, the Holy Spirit at the River Jordan. You can go and look it up. He didn't do any miracles before then. He had to receive power. Jesus modeled every way that we are supposed to operate in this world because otherwise, if he didn't, we would just go, well, that was Jesus. I'll never be like Jesus. He modeled it so that we could do exactly what he did. And if you don't believe that, then you have to go through and start cutting parts of your Bible out, especially the part where Jesus said, you will do the works that I do in greater because I go to the Father. So they, so they ask, Why? Jesus, we're confused. Why could we not drive it out? Jesus answers their question. He says, because of your unbelief. Now, people struggle with this, and I will go on and read the rest of it. People struggle with this because, guess what? At this church, we believe in healing. And in this church, I can tell you, we've seen people get healed, and we've seen people not get healed. And this may cause some of you to leave, but I'm going to tell you, I, 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 I'm a big believer in the statement, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth. The Bible never Never, ever, 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 ever comes up with the theology that we can come up with today of why people aren't healed. Here's some common ones. Well, maybe it's not his timing. Do you know that there's not one place in the Bible that people uh, petitioned the apostles of Jesus Christ or Jesus himself where they said, Lord Jesus, heal me. And he's like, listen, that's not my time. My father, he works on a different calendar than all of you. You're just going to have to have faith, and maybe someday it will happen. Never, not once. Do you know the, the longest healing that took place were the ten lepers? Jesus said when they petitioned him for healing, go your way and show yourself to the priest. And it says, as they went, they were healed. That is the longest period of time that a healing didn't manifest. And really, all it was waiting on was their belief. Because think about it, it takes a lot of faith that if Jesus is like, listen, go show yourself to the priest so that you can see that you're clean. And they're looking at themselves and they got sores all over their body. But they're like, the master said it. So as they went, they were healed. And only one came back to thank him. Here's another one. Well, maybe it wasn't God's will. Do you know not one place, nowhere in the Bible, does it say that someone petitioned the apostles for healing or someone pe petitioned Jesus himself for healing and he said, listen, that's not my father's will. Have a blessed day. Nowhere. But isn't it interesting that depending on what type of church you're in, these are the excuses, and I'm going to call them excuses, that are given why people are not healed. If you can find the scripture, bring it to me and show me. It's going to take you an eternity because it's not there. But I challenge you, go ahead and show it to me. There's nowhere. Jesus never refused healing to anyone. And there was no lapse in time for his miracles. But we accept these things today as going, well, you know just who knows the mind of God? Instead of going, why aren't we taking the responsibility on ourselves? Literally, the apostle's like, Jesus, what, you know, why, why could we not do it? Well, you know, the sun wasn't at the right apex today. There's so many things going on in the spirit realm that you don't know about. No, he said, your unbelief did it. Your little faith did it. Now, I want to show you something interesting. This is actually recorded in three Gospels. Um, Luke just kind of does an overview, but Mark paints a different story. So we're going to see the exact same story. Go to Mark 9. So in essence, not that we want to assign blame, whose fault was it that the boy didn't get healed? Say it really loud. The disciples. 
Jesus said it, right? No, no condemnation, no guilt, but Jesus said, it's your fault. Well, this Jesus is really mean. This is the savior of the world. He's trying to tell them, look, guys, I won't be here forever. I'm going to send you the spirit, but you're going to have to operate as a unit together and do the things that I do. Okay, so Mark 9, same story. Okay, go down to verse 14. It says, when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw Jesus, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he says, what are you discussing? And it says, one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. What does that sound like to you in medical terms? And Jesus said it was a demon. I told your disciples to cast it out. So same thing, the father telling the disciples, I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And Jesus answered and said, oh, unbelieving generation. Uh, this time, apparently in this recording, they didn't record the uh, you perverse generation part, but it's still the unbelieving. You unbelieving generation, you people without faith, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. Now, here's where this story comes at it from a different perspective. They brought the boy to him. When Jesus saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father this, how long has this been happening? And he said, from childhood. So obviously, this is a grown son of his now. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Remember, that was the same way it was described in the Matthews account. Now, look at this. This is fascinating to me. But if you, Jesus, can do anything Take pity on us and help us. Have any of you, and I'm going to put my hand up first, have any of you ever been in a moment in your life where things are just really bad and you cry out to the Lord in a similar way going, God, if you can do anything to help this situation, help me. Can I see hands of anybody? Okay, so, I'm, so, so you're with me on this. Okay, so, so let's see what Jesus said because we've cried out that prayer before. Take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, question mark. If I can. Man, this Jesus is just so different than what I imagined him. But that's what he's saying. If, if I can, look what it says. All things are possible to him who, what? Believes. Jesus is saying, this question is not if I can. And for us as new covenant believers, it's not a question is if he can. The, the answer is he already did at the cross. By his wounds, we were healed. That word healed in the Greek is iaomai, which is the Greek word for physical healing. Because some people are like, well, he's talking about spiritual healing. Well, then they use the wrong Greek word. Iaomai. Why am I pressing this? Because if, if our minds don't renew to the fact that we can walk in health, then what we learned on Tuesday, because of an ignorance, because of not discerning the Lord's body correctly, not discerning the purpose for all of us, despite the snow, to come to church, to edify one another, to build up one another, to love on one another, to take communion together. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine 29, it says, many of you are weak and sick and have died prematurely because you have not discerned the purpose of the Lord's body. 
and I'm telling you that the church is weak and sick and dying prematurely because we have not discerned the purpose that we are to lay hands on each other and heal each other. And some of you are like, I just don't know if I can't believe, if I believe that, I don't know if I'm there yet. And then my, my loving response is, then it won't work for you. Because according to this, it works by faith. Could Jesus be any more clear? He rebuked the disciples. And then when they asked him privately, he basically told them a second time, it's because you're unbelieving. It's because you're a perverse generation. You're unbelieving. That's why it didn't work. Now look at this. When the father, this is the father of a son. And Jesus says, what are you asking me? If I can, that is the wrong question. What you need to do, father of the son, is believe. Now, it says, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, now this is why I believe healing flowed, because if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up, is what the scriptures say. Look what it says. It says, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. So he's saying, I've, I've got some faith in this, but it's being shaken, help unbelief my unbelief. I'm admitting I got some doubts in this. Help me. And it says, when Jesus saw that the crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. And after crying out, throwing him into a terrible convulsion, it came out and the boy became like a corpse that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. When he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him. So then we go into the whole thing again. And, and just so you know, because I know somebody's going to ask me that, and I, and I don't have time to go on all this, people are like, yeah, but what about that line that says that this kind doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting? I'm not going to give you the whole background about this. If you actually would come to healing you, you would learn this. In Matthew, he says... Because of your unbelief, for truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, remove yourself and go into the sea, and you do not doubt in your heart, it will happen. And then there's this tag on the end that says, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And people are like, well, this doesn't really make any sense because he just told them it was because of their unbelief. But now this is somehow the praying and fasting demon. How do we figure that one out? When it says this kind, kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. He's talking about their unbelief. How do you get rid of doubt and unbelief? Talk to God, prayer, and fasting. Deny your most basic carnal instinct, which is to consume food. Right? You want to be more spiritual? Then deny your flesh. Praying and fasting is something that a believer should do on a regular basis basis. And you know what? Even the Pharisees did that. You ever heard the story where Jesus is talking about the tax collector and the Pharisee, and they're both praying to God? And what does the Pharisee say? I fast twice a week. So even religious people fast. And he says, and I tithe of everything I possessed. So if you tithe and you fast and you pray, you're up to religious person's level. You want to exceed that? Do you want to be spiritual? Do you want to be a lover of Jesus Christ? You got to go way beyond that. Again, I'm telling you this because I'm telling you, and I've talked to my leaders about this, I am tired of not seeing results. We're not running healing you because we need something to do on Tuesday nights. I want to see everyone healed because the Bible says we can. And, I'm, and, and I don't want anybody, including myself, I wrestle with this all the time going, well, you know what? We did everything right. It's just up to God. That's not what it says. Jesus never says that. So we've literally created a theology based on nothing. Because why? We don't actually want to wrestle with the fact it might be our fault. I think that's a sickness in our society, don't you think? It's not my fault. It's not my fault. That person, I know I got angry and really hurt that person, but they made me do it. They got me so upset. Well, grow up. Get your emotions under control. 
But I'm saying we don't like to place blame on yourself. And please, I'm telling you, don't misunderstand because I know that there is a lot of church hurt out there where you may have been in some kind of Pentecostal church. Something didn't happen. I mean, I've heard every story. I've heard stories about somebody's baby being born, stillborn. And literally the pastor looked at him and said, well, you know, if you would have had more faith, this baby wouldn't be dead. That's awful. That's terrible. Okay? We're not here to condemn. But listen. We cannot throw truth out the window because it's inconvenient for us. This scripture clearly says that the father didn't have unbelief according to Mark chapter 9. The scriptures clearly say that the disciples had unbelief according to Matthew chapter 17. So because we have spiritual insight into the story, we actually see surrounding this situation with the demon-possessed boy. The father had unbelief and the disciples had unbelief. How are you going to bring forth the miracle if everybody's in doubt and unbelief? It stops the power of God. Do you know that the Bible says in the book of James that it says, believe, but let the person that wishes to receive from God do not doubt in your heart. For if you have any doubt in your heart, you're tossed by the sea, you're unsure of yourself, you're misguided in all your ways. And it literally says this phrase, let that person expect to receive nothing from God. Nothing from God. Well, Lord, it just seems like my prayers aren't answered. I don't know what God's waiting on. Maybe he's waiting on you to believe. And again, I, I want this to lift you up because, but you know the phrase, the truth hurts sometimes. But once you get the truth, the truth will make you free. Okay, I got one more. And then this, this will be, this will really shock you and, and, and maybe even cause you to come and ask me questions after the service about this other thing that I'm going to show you that Jesus did. Because it's, in my opinion, um, there's many scriptures that are misinterpreted, but this is one of the most misunderstood situations in the Bible. Go to John 11. Remember, I'm bringing these situations up because if you don't want to take my word for it, take Jesus' word for it. You had the same story told from two different perspectives that unbelief from Jesus' own words is what stops the power of God. Okay, everybody know the story of raising Lazarus from the dead? You heard that one before? Jesus hears his friend is sick, and he's so distraught that he waits two more days before he comes to see him. But, of course, we see the end of the story and understand that he did this for a purpose. And there's all kinds of great nuggets in there. The fact that Lazarus had been dead four days is huge because Jewish tradition places that once you reach the fourth day, basically the spirit kind of hovered over the body for three days, and then after the fourth day, psh, it's gone. So, you know, Jesus, again, is breaking down all of these stereotypes. But I want to show you something um, that will really change your understanding of what is really going on in this situation with Lazarus. So let's skip down to verse 17. And I'm going to go through this quickly or attempt to. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days, meaning Lazarus. He's been dead for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary. So it's basically saying because Jerusalem is the main city, they're so close, there's, there's basically a crowd of people there coming out to weep with the sisters. Okay. Uh, Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, now this is very important what they say and how Jesus responds to come to the conclusion that we're going to come to. So Martha says this, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know whatever you ask God, God will give you. Okay, so here's the thing. I believe, this is what, and, 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 and again, this is what the point of I want to say is sometimes we boast of where we think we're at and we really have no clue where we're at. Because look at this statement that Martha makes. You can ask God anything and God will give it to you. Saying this to Jesus. 
So Jesus says, listen, your brother will rise again. Martha said, yeah, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus clarifies, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. Do you know when I quoted John 14, 12, it says believers will do the things I do and greater. It never, now, I know this is a semantical argument because the name Christian wasn't given till later in the book of Acts, but you know, we are called believers and so literally by the definition of our name, we are to do what? Believe. At the end of Mark, when it says believers will lay hands on the sick, they will drive out demons, they will speak with new tongues, it doesn't say Christians, it says believers. So he says, if you believe in me, you will live even if he dies. And everyone who currently lives and believes in me will never die. What is he talking about? The first one, he's speaking from a carnal perspective. You, when you physically die, if you believe in me, then yet you will live. And then the second one is the greater reality, none of us ever die. Thank you for those two amens. You will not die. And look what he says. He says, if you believe, and then he enters the phrase, do you believe this, Martha? And look what she says. Yes, Lord, I have believed, past tense, that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Is that what Jesus said? Hey, Martha, do you believe that I am the Christ, the Son of God that is to come into the world? No, what did he say? Do you believe that if someone believes in me that you will never die? And of course, he's alluding to what's going to happen with Lazarus. And Martha's like, yeah, yeah, I believe. I believe you're the Christ. That's like the question today. Well, do you believe that Jesus can heal all of your sins? Yes. Yes, I do. Do you believe that Jesus will heal all of your diseases? I believe that he's the Christ, the son of the living God. That's not what I asked you. So let's go on. We don't want to just come down on Martha. We want to Kick Mary, too. Here we go. <laughs> when she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to eat there. You sometimes have to read what people are saying and realize it's not true, okay? Because people are like, well, every word of the Bible is true. Um, you can't take things that the Bible says are inaccurate and then make them truth. For instance, if you read the book of Job, his friends' advice sucked. And see, people will quote this all the time. We used to sing it in a song that we will never sing again. He gives and takes away. You give and take away. That's ridiculous. Well, Job said it. Well, it turns out that God shows up in the world when and says, Job, you are wrong. Don't sing that song. It's not true. Well, it's a quote from the Bible. Judas went out and hung himself. That's a quote from the Bible, too. You can't take quotes from the Bible. So, like, this is a perfect example. It says that the Jews assumed that she was going to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the grave to weep over Lazarus. Is that where she was going? No, she was going to see Jesus, so that's wrong. So it says, therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Sound familiar? Sisters sound alike. When Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping. Why are they weeping? Because Lazarus is dead. He was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. This is inaccurate. Okay? I'm going to take you to the Greek. If I can get it here. John.
Okay, you're going to have to look this up for me, dear, because I need John 11. It's like John 1 verse 3, so you can figure that out. I'm not going to sit up here and take time to do that. But anyway, if you go down to the place, and I'm, I want to read the actual definition. So if you just type it on my search engine, John 11 interlinear, it'll just go right there. Duck, duck, go, not Google. Amen. Okay, so this word where it says deeply moved, because of the context around it, it says Jesus saw the girls, the sisters weeping. He saw the Jews weeping. It says he was deeply moved in his spirit and he was troubled. Many people will teach this and assume that Jesus is saying, well, he was moved too because, you know, like the Bible says, weep with those who weep. That is not what that word is. Did you find it? No. I'll just do it. Okay. I got it here. I don't know why it... There we go. And go. All right, here we go. And... Oh, I went right to it. Good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Okay, it says, when he saw them weeping, he was deeply moved. Here is the Greek word. The Strong's word is 1690. It is the word embryomai. Here's the definition. To be moved with anger. To admonish sternly. Here's the usage. It says, I snort with the notion of coercion springing out of displeasure, anger, indignation, and antagonism, express indignant displeasure with someone or to charge sternly. Here's what it really, the, the actual Greek words broken up because some of these are compound words. It means to, uh, to literally snort. Snort like, you know how like a horse does? <laughs> that. To snort with rage or to express strong indignation. So let's go back. I'm going to keep that open there so I don't get rid of it. So listen, Jesus just talked to Martha about what? If you believe this, you know it's going to happen. Oh, yeah, 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 I believe that you're the Christ. All right, go get me Mary. Mary comes out. Well, if you could have been here, my brother would not have died. It says, after he looked and he saw her weeping, he saw the Jews weeping. Now let's insert what this actual word really means. After he saw this, he snorted in his spirit. He was moved with anger and indignation. And it says, and he troubled himself. So it wasn't he was weeping with those who weep. He wasn't looking around and going, oh, these poor people. He was upset. Well, why? Okay, so after it says that, it says, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. And then it says, Jesus wept. You can disagree with me, but I'm saying based on what you just read, I believe he's not weeping because they're sad. He's not weeping because Lazarus is dead, because guess what? He's going to raise Lazarus. He is weeping. He is agonizing. His anger is moving him to tears with compassion because the amount of unbelief in the area is staggering. So it says, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, here we go again. So Jesus is weeping, but I showed you from the context that in his spirit, he was moved with anger and indignation, and it says he was troubled. And the Jews, are, and, and so, you know, sometimes when you're troubled and you just feel like you're, you're breaking under the stress and all that, sometimes just tears begin to flow. And the Jews are like, oh, see how he loved him. That's not what, the, that's not what we just read. So once again, the Jews were like, hey, I think Mary's going out to the tomb. She wasn't going out to the tomb. Hey, I think Jesus is weeping because he just loved Lazarus so much. No, actually, he's very angry and with indignation and troubled in his spirit. And it says, but some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? So Jesus again, everybody say again, being deeply moved. That is the same Greek word as being saying after he just heard them going, well, couldn't this guy have raised Lazarus from the dead? I mean, he's opened blind eyes. I mean, what if he just was here? All of this stuff. He is now moved with indignation and anger in his spirit again.
So it says, after being angry in his spirit again, he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. And what does Martha say? Hey, Lord, remember when I believed you and I confessed you as Christ? We're going to move that stone right away. Get, get on it. No, what did she say? He stinketh. That's in the old King James. He stinketh. He's been dead for a long time. He's a rotting corpse. Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said, did I not say to you that if you believe, there it is again, did I not say to you, I am the son of God. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. This thing is no big deal for me. No, he said, what did I say to you? If you believe, you will see the glory of God. How many of you want to see the glory of God? Guess what? You just believe. Get rid of that doubt. So they remove the stone, and he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may what? Believe. He's always doing it for our benefit. Now, please don't misunderstand Jesus here. I didn't, I'm trying my best to not just paint him as he's just this angry guy. He's upset because doubt and unbelief is the devil. Okay? Because the word is truth, right? It says we worship the Father and Spirit in the truth. And Jesus says my word is truth. So anything that fights against truth is doubt and unbelief. And that is the devil because the devil hates truth. The Bible says that he's a liar. He's the father of lies. So Jesus is grieved. He's troubled. He's angry. He's not angry at the people. He's angry because unbelief has so perverted this world, this generation of people, that we can't even believe the things that Jesus says. Jesus talked to Mary over and over again. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? I'm the resurrection of life. Do you believe? Do you believe? Yes, Lord. Whatever you ask God, I believe that he'll do it. She obviously doesn't believe that because he's like, okay, remove the stone. How come nobody was like, he said, remove the stone. He's going to raise Lazarus. Oh man, I've heard about this guy. He's just so awesome. Nobody was saying that. Nobody believed it. And he already had a reputation about himself. Well, he can open blind eyes. Well, people that are on their deathbed, he can, he can heal their sickness. I don't know about this raising from the dead stuff, though. You know, the disciples are in a boat, and Jesus is sleeping. You know, we've seen Jesus just literally multiply food for 10,000 people, but the wind is boisterous, and there's like lightning and stuff. I don't know. I think we're going to die. And we can laugh because we weren't there, but I can guarantee you if the water's coming in the boat and you're in the middle of the ocean, you're freaking out, too. But see, that's the thing. We need to stop looking at our circumstances. Either the word is true or God is a liar. And if he's not a liar and the word is true, then that means our circumstances, everything around us that fights against what the word of God says, that's the lie. I know there's like no good way to transition into worship after this message, but I'm, I, I, again, hear my heart. I want to encourage you. I'm literally just preaching to myself here because I got a lot of doubt and unbelief in my life. And you just get the privilege of hearing it because I got to preach it out loud to me. This message is just as much for me as it is for anybody else here. We have to move into a place where believers are actually believing. And you know what? Here's the bottom line. If you don't want to believe, that's fine. I'm, I'm good with it. If, if you're like, well, you know, I'll just, I'll just take the go to heaven someday, but this whole like, like striving and believing for healing and all of this kind of stuff, I just don't want to have anything to do with that. Fine. Be sick. It's not condemnation. It's just like I tell people all the time. People are like, well, pastor, should I go to the doctor? Should I do this? I'm led. And I tell them, be led by the Spirit. If you want to go to the doctor, go to the doctor. I'm not against doctors and medicine. But you have to realize that once you go down some of these roads, that's where you have put your life into their hands. Okay? That's just what it is. That's no, it's not wrong. But you can decide whether you trust God or not. 
And we need to come to that. We need to come to that place where we just, do we believe that how will he not also through Jesus freely give us all things? If you really believe all things, then like what we talked about with faith, why don't you act like it's true? I should act like it's true. And if you don't want to act like it's true, don't tell me about your faith. Because the Bible says you will know people by their fruit, not by what they say. So I want to challenge all of us that we should be yielding supernatural fruit, especially now in this day. Because you've got generations of kids that are coming up that think all this stuff is fairy tales. And until they see the power of God working, the power in the gospel, the real tangible results, it's just a story to them. And, and if we're not careful, if the devil deceives you enough, it'll just become a story to you too. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. It says he healed all who were oppressed by the devil. Jesus' commission is our commission, if you believe. So I want to invite you to become a believing believer and to put away doubt. And you know what? If you've got some doubt, just be humble about it, like the Father. Yeah, Lord, I know I got some unbelief. Can you help me with that? lead me into not being in unbelief anymore. And the Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace. In fact, a greater grace, superabounding grace to the humble. So if we would just be real on where our shortcomings are and where we're having a hard time believing, God's going to come in and meet you there.